Second Chronicles chapter 7. And let's look at verses 13 and 14. A very familiar passage of scripture for most of us. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Cynthia, could I have a little bit more volume on the floor, please? Once you found it, won't you say amen? If I shut up heaven, maybe just a little bit less. If I shut up heaven, there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence amongst my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then someone say then will i hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land i want to preach this morning from the thought god's prescription for a troubled world God's prescription for a troubled world. You would almost have to live under a rock to not be aware of the multiple shootings that have taken place here in the city of Noonan just this week alone. In fact, there were five shootings which have left two dead, which have left two critical, and one wounded. There's been so much chatter via social media and around town. There's a lot of finger pointing. Some would like to think that it's just exclusive to the black community. Some like to think it's a gang problem. Some like to think it's a lack of education issue. Some like to think that it's an issue of people that just have nothing better to do with their time. Some like to think that it's the fact that parents have not raised children properly. And when you really think about all of those things, we can point fingers all day long. But there's only one root of all evil. And the root of all evil, the root of all wrong in life, the root of everything that is not as it should be is always sin. The reality is that it's not fair to point uh, fingers at any one particular community. All of us in here of the African-American community, I don't think any of us have murdered anybody. I don't know. I haven't been with y'all all day today. I don't. Don't know what you did before you got here. Uh, It's not a matter of raising children. There's a parent in here this morning that can testify. You can raise your children to the best of your ability. But at the end of the day, they have their own mind. They have their own free will. And they have their own vocation to do whatever they can do. And so when these situations arise, when these situations confront us head on, when we are presented with these problems, our human nature is to always displace accurate blame. And so because we don't want to get to the root of the problem, because we don't want to address the sin of our own humanity, we look everywhere else but at ourselves. This is not an African-American issue. This is not an issue of, of rearing. This is not an issue of education, but this is an issue of sin. And somebody ought to know what I'm talking about this morning. There should be someone in here that can testify that sin will literally separate you from God. Second Timothy 3 and 1 through 7 says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, 
but denying its power, avoid such people. For amongst them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. And when you look at this kind of sickness that is, that's in the world, it is clear that the world is in need of treatment from God. Whenever I am extremely sick, if I'm painfully sick, I'm not going to sit at home and allow my ailments to grow and to fester. But when I'm extremely sick, I know it's important of me to go to the doctor so that I might either get a prescription, get some kind of treatment, and get some kind of diagnosis. Whenever you allow a cold to fester without taking something, the cold might turn into the flu. If you allow the flu to fester without taking something, the flu might turn into pneumonia. And I want to tell you, I've already preached a message to somebody this morning. When you leave your sin unchecked, your sin grows into something even greater than what it was to begin with. It started out by you thinking it was okay to miss a few Sundays. It's just Sunday. I'll catch them on the next Sunday. I'll, I'll catch up at Bible study. I'll stream in online. Then it grew to you saying, you know what? I can do and say anything in front of my children. And then you think they're not paying attention. And you turn around and now your children are saying what it is that you you are saying you thought that it was cute when she was a toddler and she was dancing but now she's 15 and 16 and she can't even walk without twerking you thought that it was cute for your kids to smoke in fact all kids smoke weed it's okay they all experiment with drugs and now they're not smoking weed they're popping mollies they're doing ecstasy they're doing everything and it's spun out of control now she's pregnant for the second time with two different baby fathers now now, he's been to jail three times and has got children by multiple women, none of which he takes care of. I'm preaching in here this morning. Now they're not working. They're robbing and they're stealing and they're murdering and they're raping all because we allowed sin to creep in and we did not check it. This is one of those Pentecostal messages this morning that may not get too many amens. If you're going to make it to see Jesus, we cannot live any kind of way down here and this then expect to die and go to heaven. The problem with society is not in the school system. The problem in society is not in the church building. The problem in society is that we as people, not a black people, not a white people, but we as people have gotten removed from God. We don't pray at home like we used to. We don't tell our children who God is like we used to. We're more concerned with children being basketball stars and football stars and won't bring them to Sunday school. School. We are more concerned with education than we are about them knowing who David is, who Elijah is, who Moses is. And then when tragedy comes, the first place we run is the first place that we left. You didn't bring them through the house of God when they were out doing everything. Don't bring them in here when they've done everything they can think to do. That's not the time. Problem is people don't want to subscribe and listen to the voice of God. And then when calamity comes from not obeying God, we run to God. But the good news of this gospel message this morning is that even when we make mistakes... Even when we ignore God, even when we allow our sin to go unchecked, even when we go left, when God has told us to go right, that God loves us so much that he still is good to us. And there should be about three or four of y'all in here, I'll make five, that can say there have been times in my life when I did the wrong thing, but God was still good to me. And after watching the first five minutes of the news on any given day of the week, it is clear that this world is sick. And whenever I'm sick, the first thing I try to do is figure out, first of all, how did I get sick? Why am I sick? And verse 13 says, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence amongst my people. One of the main questions we've got to ask ourselves is how. Someone has been wondering how was the world in such a sick place? It's because of sin. Things that used to matter are no longer important to us. Can I give you an example of that? 
There used to be a time when uh, it did not matter what was going on on a Sunday. You going to be at church. And all of us know in today's society, there is no excuse to not find yourself in church at least once a week. You've got 8 a.m. services, 10 a.m. services, 11 a.m. services. Some church have Saturday services at 6 o'clock. Some churches have Sunday service at 6 o'clock. You can watch church on your phone. But now church has seemed to have taken the back seat. It used to be that people were concerned with the house of God. Now you take the money that God has blessed you with. You'll spend $100 on a concert ticket to see someone sing about your neighbors knowing his name and he doesn't even know your name. You'll pay $100 to sit in the nosebleed section of Phillips Arena and then you'll come to church and you'll put $2 in the offering pan. I'm not talking about here. We're good. I'm talking about everywhere, wherever you go. All because what used to be important is no longer important. My brothers and my sisters, the good news comes in verse 14. Somebody say good news. Oh, here it is. It's really good news. If my people, which are called by my name, shall do it, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's not enough to know who you are. You've got to know whose you are. Because he says, if my people, and who are his people? His people are believers. Not people who talk about it, but people who are about it. There's a difference between saying you are a believer and actually being a believer. You can come in here on Sunday and sing belief. You can come here on Sunday and preach belief. But a believer or being a believer is about what happens when you walk out of those doors. The life that we live determines whether or not we believe. In fact, a good example of that, when uh, God told Noah to build the ark, and Noah went out preaching. Noah told everybody every day, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain. And nobody believed him. If they would have believed him, then they would have come and helped him build the ark. Then they would have gone in it. But because they did not believe, they did not act on what, Mo on what Noah said. And so then when the rain came, when the rain started pouring, when the lightning started flashing, they then ran to Noah and said, let us in. Oh, and your faith and your walk with God is the exact same way today. You can listen to Pastor Cook every Sunday and you can act like you believe. You can stand up and you can say amen. You can run and wallow in the floor. You can foam at the mouth. You can speak in tongues. But it's not about what you do in here. It's about what happens when you you get out there. I know there are some people that are praying that God is going to be so kind that when Jesus returns, he returns on Sunday morning while we're in church. I believe everybody's saved in church. I believe if you can't be saved anywhere else, at least when you come in church, you're saved. But I want to tell you, I would not gamble with my life and only be saved when I come in the house of God. I want to be able to walk out of these doors and live the life that we preach and sing about in this house. And all this week, with so much going on, I saw a lot of people praying on Facebook. I saw people that were we're just all kinds of messed up. And I understand that when things happen that we can't control and we don't understand, I understand it sends your mind through different channels. But I wanted so desperately to tell some of them, and I'm glad I didn't. Y'all keep praying for me. You shouldn't say, F the world. I don't need nobody but me and mine at 1153. And then log in and pray to God at 111 on the same keyboard. You just, there's some things that you should not do. Uh, there is no in-between with God. You're either on this side or you're on that side. And the message for somebody is, is that whatever you're going to be, you need to be consistent. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to be saved, be saved. 
You can't be saved at 11 o'clock and then at 11.05 dip back into the world and then at 11.07 come back into the church and then at 11.10 when somebody says something wrong, you curse them out and try and get back in the world. You cannot flip-flop with God. Pastor, this seems like a really tough message this morning. Last Sunday, you were so pleasant. It was, it was just such a beautiful... I just want you to go to heaven. I'll never forget being in high school and uh, at our church, I used to play the organ and I had a curfew and I did not come home or to my grandmother's house at curfew. And I'd come home past curfew and uh, she didn't say anything to me. My granddad didn't say anything to me. And when we got to church on Sunday, I went over to the organ to play the organ and my grandmother looked at me and she gave me that finger to say, come here. I was playing the organ, and she kept on. I said, well, let me get off. I got off the organ while they were still singing. There was only the drums playing. My grandmother said, sit down. If you're going to live under my roof, you're going to serve one God. You stay all out, you stay out. Sit down right here. We don't need no music. And I didn't understand then what she was trying to say, but what grandmother had demonstrated to me is that when it comes to working for God and when it comes to obeying God, there is no in between. You've got to be one thing or you've got to be the other. Now, I left out a very crucial part of that story that y'all don't need to know. That makes that relevant. I'll share the details in 10 years. Secondly, you've got to humble yourselves. What do you mean? Somebody say humble. The reason we don't like to hear the preacher preach about sin is because we are arrogant. Can I stay right there for just two seconds? It won't take me long. Because as soon as any preacher stands and says what you can and cannot do, the first thing that pops up in your mind is who does he think he is? He's a man just like I am. He's a, she's a woman just like I am. She does just as much wrong. He's just as guilty. It's not about who's guilty. It's not about who's wrong. When God is speaking to you, God is speaking to you about you. This is about self-accountability this morning. There are a whole lot of people that are going to miss heaven because they're focused on the imperfections of men and women of God. Christ is the only example that we have. If you're trying to be like Pastor Cook, listen, let me stop you right where you are. I'm not the one. I will let you down. You can ride with me in my car for about 10 minutes and it won't take long for you to see that you ought to be more like Jesus and not like me. After you remember whose you are, after you've humbled yourself, and thirdly, after you have prayed, somebody says, I must pray. Someone here knows the power of prayer. Not only do you know the power of prayer, but you know the power of the prayers of someone else. Because the reality is, is that all of us have been somewhere that we should not have been. All of us have done something that we should not have done, but someone was praying on our behalf. And I bet there's a mother in here. I bet there's a father in here, an aunt and uncle who's praying for somebody in your family who doesn't have enough sense to pray for themselves. But wait a minute. You shout it too soon. Here it is. The second half of James 5 and 16 says, The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. If you want your prayers to avail, you must live righteous. Sin literally messes every aspect of our lives up. Now watch this. God is so good to us that he loves us in spite of our wrongs and our faults. God never stops loving us. But when you live an unrighteous life, you are literally devaluing your own prayer. What do you mean, Pastor Cook? When you can't even pray because you're thinking about the wrong that you've done. Before you can get off of your knees, you're telling yourself, God won't hear me because I did this and because I did that. 
When you remove sin from your life, it gives you an opportunity to pray to God with a clear conscience, and then you can actually leave it with God. But the reason some of us can't leave our prayers and concerns with God is because some of us live such a messed up life that we think God will not answer us based on the wrong that we've done. And I want to tell you this morning, yes, you've got to live righteous, but whenever you pray to God... You've got to be able to leave it there. If you're going to pray about it, don't worry about it. If you're going to worry about it, then don't pray about it. And after you remember, as I'm done here, after you remember whose you are, after you've humbled yourself, after you've prayed, then you've got to do one more thing. Someone say one more thing. Then you've got to turn from your wicked ways. That's a difficult one there, isn't it? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. As long as you continue to live the exact same way, you will not change. Salvation is not so much about perfection as you think it is. Salvation is about growth. Jesus wants you to grow. If you were going to reach perfection, Jesus never would have had to come. You could have died for everybody in here, but because you would never get to that place, Jesus had to come in our place because we could never be Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen in here. And so when you understand that, then you understand that there are some things that we used to do that we can no longer do. That's called growth. It might be painful. It might be an adjustment initially, but at some point it gets a little easier. And after you've turned from your wicked ways, the Bible says, then God will heal this land. God will heal this land. I'm I'm here to tell you this morning, Oprah cannot do it. I saw last night where Oprah sat down with Miley Cyrus and and, uh, or or, and tried to have some kind of intervention. And uh, I want to tell you that Oprah can't do it for us this morning. Medicine can't do it. Prison cannot do it. Gangs, guns and violence. None of those things can do it. Education won't do it. But Only God can. And when you talk about prescriptions for a sick and a troubled world, every time I've gotten a prescription, there have been some some warnings on that prescription. One of the things is said, don't take this medicine on an empty stomach. When you talk about God healing the land and God giving you a prescription, you can't take God's medicine on an empty stomach. That's why you've got to come to church and hear God's word because the Bible says that man cannot live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. On the back of that medicine it says do not take this medicine with alcohol. Yeah, yeah. You can't expect God to give you a prescription and you put any old thing in your body. I'm not talking about drinking. You search your own self for that. I'm talking about you living a kind of life that causes you to get drunk where you cannot focus on God. And now what God is putting in you is altered by the effects of the life that you're living. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. But then the last piece on there says, if you are pregnant... You may not should take this medicine. It says women who are pregnant should not take this medicine. But I want to flip that thing. All of us in here should always be pregnant with something from God. If God has not impregnated you with something, if God has not impregnated you with something, then something is wrong in your life because all of us have purpose. And all of us in here ought to be able to testify that, that I'm pregnant with purpose every morning that I wake up, every morning that I've got breath in my body. I'm pregnant with purpose because it means that God is not through with me yet. And I want to tell you this morning that if you've got purpose in your life, then you ought to be able to wake up every morning and please God with your life. You ought to wake up in the morning and say, how can I give God glory on today? You you ought to wake up in the morning with your mind stayed on Jesus. And I want to tell somebody this morning, the problem in the world is not in the school system. They may have taken prayer out of the school, but who took prayer out of your home? The problem in the world is not in the church. There may be hypocrites in the church, but there are just as many hypocrites in the world as there are in church. 
but I don't see you not going to your job because of hypocrites. I, I don't see you not going to the baseball and the football games because of hypocrites. Somebody ought to be able to testify that for God I'll live and for the Lord I will die. And I want to tell you this morning that God is telling somebody in here this morning to go out into the highways and the byways and tell a young man and a young woman that God is real. Somebody ought to be able to testify that guns and violence are not the answer. Some, somebody ought to be able to testify that drugs may take you higher, but when the drugs have worn off, you're going to crash to the ground. But there ought to be somebody that can say when you lift up the name of Jesus that he'll put you up that no man can bring you down. And I wonder is there anybody in here this morning that can high five your neighbor and say neighbor I've got the answer this morning. What is the answer this morning to everything that's wrong in your life? His name is Jesus. Jesus is the answer this morning for all the world. No matter what the problem is this morning, you ought to take it to the Lord in prayer. This and that, you ought to put it all in his hands. And I wonder, is there anybody in here this morning that can take your burdens to the Lord and you can leave them there? I might be sick this morning, but I can take it to the Lord. This generation might be messed up this morning, but I can take them to the Lord. Riddling cannot do it. Counseling cannot do it. But somebody knows only Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Shout yes. 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 Only, only Jesus, only Jesus. God's prescription for a sick world is not going to come from where we want it to come from. It's amazing how we can compartmentalize God to fit our life. We like to say when we do wrong, God doesn't change. God loves me anyway. But then... That same God who we say loves us when we're wrong and does not change. All of a sudden now that same God has changed on things that used to be wrong. Yeah, Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some things used to be wrong and now nothing is wrong. Now as long as it makes you happy, God is happy with it. I want you to know that the world is ever changing. But the same God yesterday is the same God today. He's going to be the same God tomorrow. That same God is telling us with this generation, with every problem, with every sickness, with every issue that's going on in the world, the only way to solve it is if my people, which called by my name, that's the only way.